Thank you, Kennedy. And right now it's time for that time when we talk to our special guest. Tonight's special guest is Deborah Coddington. Deborah is a well-known journalist and a former member of Parliament for the ACT Party. In a recent article in the New Zealand Herald, Deborah examined the reality behind voluntary euthanasia. For someone losing a mum or dad, it's not that simple to make the big decision. We welcome Deborah Coddington as our special guest on The Beat Goes On. Deborah Coddington, welcome to The Beat Goes On. Thank you for having me here. What a wonderful life you've had. Have I? Yes, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, well, you've been a member of parliament. You've been a, a top flight journalist, born 1953. Are we allowed to um, talk about that of sensitive course. issue? No, I'm, I'm not <laughs> sensitive about it at all. Where were you born in this wonderful country of ours? I was born in Waipukarau. Do you know where that is? Waipukarau. Yes, look, I've got a... Central Hawke's Bay. Central Hawke's mm, Bay. Mm, what mm. is Waipukarau famous for? Deborah Coddington and what else? Ice cream. Ice Peter, cream. Peter Pan ice cream. I, I remember the name, Peter Pan ice cream. So mm. what was it like living in Central Hawke's Bay? Uh, it was... We were a hard-working family. Yes, mm. a lovely childhood. Very mm. free. Horses. How many in the family? Four brothers and me. Wow. So I was a bit of a tomboy, really. So you yeah. had to climb trees faster yeah. than the boys? Yeah, they, yeah. they gave me no mercy. <laughs> they teased me <laughs> so much. Would that explain you going on to becoming a journalist and a member of parliament? That, that you had no fear after having four brothers that teased you? Po possibly, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they used to beat me up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother would never take my side. Wouldn't she? She'd just say, ignore them. <laughs> don't take any notice of them or so, don't be a baby. So when did you realise you weren't a boy? I think when I went to boarding school when I was 13. Girls yeah. boarding, I was sent to girls boarding school to try and turn me into a lady. And uh, did it work? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, what made you be the crusader? I don't know whether that's a good word crusader but uh, you grew up and you obviously wanted to say something. You wanted to express yourself and you weren't, you weren't afraid to come forward and say things, were you? So where do you think that comes from? Was your mum and dad when you sat at the table at night? For, you remember we used to have uh, yes. dinner together, didn't well, we? Well, we always did, yes. Yeah. And um, my parents were farmers, sheep farmers in Hawke's Bay. It was dad who wanted me to be a journalist. Um, and did you want to be a journalist? I wanted to be an air hostess. Ah. But I came home with my report when I was about nine or ten, I think, mm. and the English teacher, the, well, just the teacher, primary school teacher, had said about my English that it was my, I had a good um, vocab, um, but my English was a bit racy, mm -hmm. and I didn't know what that meant. And Dad said, well, I think you'd be a good journalist. And mm. I said, what's a journalist? And he said, a journalist goes out and interviews people and writes their stories. And I thought that sounded like it. A good thing to do. Did you, at that early age, sort of imagine what you were going to become? Um, no, I don't. I think I don't plan my life at mm. all. I I just sort of lurch from disaster project to, to project. disaster. Yes, <laughs> yes. So when did you first think to yourself, "Gosh, I am good at this. I'm I'm a good journalist." At, I never uh, think that. You never think that. No, I, I I suffer from imposter syndrome. I always think I'm going to be found out. Someone's going to tap me on the shoulder and say, "Oi, you just come quietly." Yeah. yeah where does that come from? I don't know, but yeah. I remember when I got the job at North and South as a feature writer for the first time, and I sat down and I thought, "I can't do this. Yeah. I can't write five thousand word stories." Mm. And yet you ended up doing it. Well, I don't think it's a bad thing to feel like that because yes. you actually throw yourself into it mm. and you over-research. But I do think that it's better to be uh, to lack in self-confidence in some ways mm. because you can then do a really good job. The nerves make you uh, overreach and do a really good job. Now, Deborah, you're on the show tonight because of last week's wonderful article in the New Zealand Herald all about voluntary euthanasia. I imagine you got a great response. Huge response, yes. Mm. Yes, amazing. Yes. Baby, great baby boomer subject, isn't it? It is. And I, I would not presume to tell people mm. whether they choose voluntary euthanasia or not. Now, the article was written from the fact that you've just been through the experience of losing your mother. How did you cope? In the, early, in the first sort of 18 months of the mm. first half of those three years, we used to battle quite a lot because mm. I thought she was just winding me up. Like, she wouldn't eat properly and things, so I'd make 
and she wouldn't have meals on wheels. Mm. She wouldn't have anyone coming in while she was showering or anything like mm. that. She was fiercely independent. So I would make meals for her and she'd hide them in the house and things. Gosh. If I knew she had dementia, yeah. I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said things like, why have you hidden, why is this meal in the cupboard and things yeah. like that. So when she finally was ordered by the doctor to move mm. into a home, you know, I, I thought that when you get old and you mm. want to go into a home, you've paid your taxes, you go into a home. It doesn't work like that. You have to be assessed by the DHB. Mm. And when you're like my mother and you're very good at presenting well, mm. and the person comes to assess you, you know, she'll make muffins, make a cup of tea. She looks she fine. Yes. She looks fine. And they yeah. say, you don't have to go into a home. Mm. You're very good at coping in your own house. And I'm sitting there. May, being made to feel like some dreadful woman who wants to put a mother in a home so she can get her lovely house. Mm. I just wanted, because my mother died on Anzac Day, mm. and because I was her um, enduring power of attorney, yes. and I had been caring for her for the last three years as she sank into dementia, mm. and because I also had, among her things, a living will that she had written saying that she wanted to be, uh, you know, voluntary to euthanized, go, if you like. Go in a, in if manner. she had all these mm. things on her schedule, one of which was dementia. Now, I wasn't going to do that, obviously. Not not because mm. of not just because of the legal side, but even if it was legal, if Marion Street's bill came through, my point was, what are the voluntary euthanasia society thinking? When they go around these old people and mm. sign them up, get them to sign up to this, because my mother in those five years had a wonderful life. She get, brought a lot of joy to a lot of people. Mm. She was very happy. She had a beautiful garden. She, sure, she made some, it was difficult, you know? Was she Which deep is into a form dementia? Of, in yeah. the end, she was deeply yeah. into dementia. But my point was, are we doing this when we say, when people say, I don't want to see granddad or mm. her, die this horrible death. I watched my mother die over four, five days. It's not pretty, death. Mm. She wasn't in pain, but it still wasn't pretty. Birth is not pretty. No. It's not pretty at all. But it's a natural thing. We all are born and we all die. She wasn't in pain. She was just dying. You know, but suddenly we want to make it all nice and pretty and quick. It's not like the movies, it's not like that, but we want to sanitize it and we want to do it nice and quickly so we can get on with our lives. And I just wanted people to but think yes, about the yes, nuances yeah. of this. It's not black and white. And it's part of your life that you go through that experience, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, is euthanasia for the dying or mm. the living? That's the question. So even if mum has signed a document on voluntary euthanasia, it's not that easy to make the big decision. It was signed on, on vo Auckland Voluntary Euthanasia letterhead, mm. and it said if I suffer from any of these uh, conditions listed in the schedule, I wish to have all, you know, food withheld, mm. medication withheld, all of these things. And one of them was in the schedule was dementia. Well, according to her death certificate, she'd suffered from dementia for, for the last five years. Mm. In which case, all of the medication she'd been taking for the last five years, which enabled her to enjoy a very happy and productive life, mm. I, as her enduring power of attorney, should not have been allowing her to have. So you I were, could not do that. You were looking at your mother and saying, even though this is contrary to what she expressed, uh, she looks happy and she looks well. Um, she was She'd bought and sold a house in that time. Yeah. She had made a beautiful garden. She'd been to the Napier earthquake reunion several times. She'd buy, buy bus. Mm. Um, you know, the, the, this, it's <laughs> just, you know, you can't do that. But in the end, you didn't feel bad about not carrying out your mother's request. Finally, the doctor ordered that she had to go into, into a home mm. because she was not eating, she wasn't taking her medication mm. for you know, aged diabetes, and she was just lying on the couch. And so she, this was on just before Christmas, and mm. I did, I think it was about two days before Christmas, and it was the worst thing I ever had to do was drive my mother to a home mm. and put her in before Christmas. Mm. And she was sitting at the window while I drove away. 
and I, you know, I've, mm. that was the most emotional thing. And the only way I could cope was to drive away thinking, well, you put me on boarding school once. So, <laughs> you know, I had to think hard, yeah. tough thoughts, yes, you know, because exactly. I had to do it. Anyway, that was fine. And then she, she actually found that it's mm. not so bad. Homes, mm. are, they're wonderful. They mm. have activities, they have happy hour, they have mm. you know, good food, she found good company, she made friends, had laundry done, you know, they're mm. wonderful places. The carers and the nurses, were, they were made, she was not in pain. They mm. I said to them, is mum in pain? Because she was, and they said no, every time they bathed her or changed her nightie and things, mm. they said we're watching her very carefully to see if she's flinching and she's not in pain. We can assure you she's not in pain. But you know, when people are dying, they're often going through their life. Mm. So they might be remembering bad things that happened and things. So they might be, mm. you know, their facial expressions are changing and things. So we don't know what's going on in their mm. heads. So many of us baby boomers are going through this exactly yeah. right now. So um, uh, big thanks for bringing it up because it's, uh, as I say, I, I know people going through it now and uh, it's a worrying time, isn't it? So you've really hit the nail on the head with that column. What were some I, of the comments that you found in, interesting? Keep writing about it mm. um, made me think it was very, very good. It brought in a whole lot of nuances to the debate mm. that I hadn't thought about before. Um, brought it out into the open. You need, we need to keep talking about this. I'm not saying I'm against mm. voluntary euthanasia because it's not for me to say pe to people they can't do mm. this. I just think that we need to really debate it carefully. Yeah. Deborah Coddington, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being with us on the big day. Thank you.